I see threats to cut funding for the arts in schools and even universities and schools wanting to cut programs altogether. The notion seems that if something can't make you a sufficient amount of money, then it isn't something to be taken seriously. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than full recognition of the place of the artist. And the nation which disdains the mission of art invites the fate of Robert Frost's hired man, the fate of having nothing to look backward to with pride and nothing to look forward to with hope. I am a teller of stories and therefore an optimist, a believer in the ethical bend of the human heart, a believer in the mind's disgust with fraud and its appetite for truth, a believer in the ferocity of beauty. So from my point of view, which is that of a storyteller, I see your life as already artful, waiting, just waiting and ready for you to make it art. I never thought I was allowed to study the liberal arts. Neither of my parents and none of my three older siblings have degrees. So I came into college bewildered and overwhelmed and very, very afraid that I was making the wrong decision. And so it was my goal, and I didn't realize this for a long time, to be a college success story. I felt like I had to get the degree that gave me the greatest likelihood of having a high paying, prestigious, white-collar job, and then everyone would see that college was worth it for people like me. I completely internalized the message that first-generation students get over and over again, which is to say, you don't need an education, you need job training. That's why I worked on my Bachelor's of Science in Speech and Hearing Science with the goal of becoming an audiologist. 
And you might think it's strange that I would refer to that as job training and not education, but that's what it was for me at least, because I really had no passion for it. I was putting an enormous amount of pressure on myself to be successful and to be successful in the ways that nobody I actually knew in real life was successful with money, name recognition, and titles. The other false message I'd completely internalized was that if you want any of those things, you should stay away from the liberal arts. But really, I remember thinking to myself that if I did all of that, and if I paved the way somehow, maybe my nieces or my nephews or my kids would get to follow their dreams someday. And now I'm getting my master's degree in English literature And it gives me so much joy that I can set an example for my nieces and nephews to pursue what they find meaningful. And I hope that they and other first generation students can feel a sense of ownership in every part of the university. Job skills are an important part of getting an education, but they aren't the whole education. I'm angry that we systematically undervalue less privileged students' critical thinking and inquiry which are hallmarks of a liberal arts education, and then shunt them onto vocational paths while the privileged study fine arts. The liberal arts teach us ways to develop, critique, and engage with ourselves and our complex worlds. We should ask ourselves what would happen if everyone felt welcome to pursue that. When I was in elementary school, I lived for language arts class and most of all for silent reading. Now I'm pursuing a degree in English literature and I live for reading that is not so silent. Now it's more collaborative. Taking classes in the liberal arts has helped me discover what it's like to learn from everyone in the room. I found that sometimes it's necessary to quiet my own assertions so that someone else can speak to something I haven't yet considered. I've been able to learn from professors as they distill their expertise so that I have a chance to understand it more fully. I've spent hours with my peers discussing the implications of others' words as well as our own. And when I take a moment to really consider how lucky I am to have those opportunities and to learn from so many of them, I'm invigorated. The knowledge we gain while studying the liberal arts is applicable and integral to communication everywhere else and ought to be available for everyone to pursue. That knowledge translates and the liberal arts mingle with so many other areas of learning. There are documented patterns present in office dynamics, mathematical expressions, and constellations. Who's to say none of that is allowed to be poetry? I get into trouble on a consistent basis as a kid. I fell out of place, never quite felt like I belonged. When I would get into trouble, generally I was sent to my room as punishment. I spent hours reading Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. That was my first introduction to poetry. The goofy characters took took me to a world where everyone was a little off. I wasn't alone in my feelings of alienation. That is the thing about literature. It appeals to an understanding of ourselves, to an understanding of each other. We search for answers to who we are as individuals and collectively who we are as a culture in the study of the humanities. History teaches us to grow from our mistakes in the past and to learn from the victories. Sociology helps us understand who we are collectively. Psychology pushes us to understand each other and allow us to be more sympathetic to other people's pain. Philosophy looks for answers about ourselves that can't be answered by the other sciences. Humans are complex. Our motivations are incredibly multifaceted. Human interactions can't be boiled down to numbers and graphs. The world is uncertain, and the humanities face that uncertainty. The answers gained from studying literature and history aren't clear cut, but we do gain understanding about what it means to be human. STEM will help the world grow technologically, but technological growth without self-awareness is dangerous. Corporations exploit children in other countries because it's economically viable. The earth is being poisoned by chemical advances made by DuPont. Marketing companies are manipulating consumers for profit. Without the, without the balance from the humanities, we are on a fast track to technologically advancing towards the destruction of ourselves. 
Might we have dodged a bullet if we had valued literature a little more? If more of us had read, it can't happen here? Would we now see more justice if we'd had a stronger understanding of our history, our government, the law? Would we be happier if we had paid more attention to the artwork rather than the price tag? If we'd read more poetry, instead of losing ourselves in an endless repetition of focus-tested blockbuster movie sequels? Could the liberal arts have saved us? I suppose it doesn't do much good to speculate because that's clearly not who we are as U.S. citizens. And to be fair, most Americans would probably agree unequivocally with the statements, literature is important, philosophy is beneficial, art has value, history is relevant. But when pressed on that most American question, who's going to pay for it, we always lose our resolve. Accordingly, university liberal arts programs and the academic presses and other institutional supports they rely on are being gutted across the country in favor of more profitable enterprise. A member of my own institution's board of trustees has suggested that to pursue the liberal arts is little more than a frivolous dream beneath the university's central investment of STEM and business-forward job readiness. And although it's clear this businessman doesn't know what the liberal arts are or how they generate profit for his institution, he does make one point. If we're counting careers, poetry probably isn't a growth industry. But I guess you would have to say the same is true of history. In fact, go check out employment trends for historians, artists, philosophers, critics, actors, writers, teachers, economists, political scientists. It's not a pretty sight. Grad students like me are warned constantly about the dismal state of the academic job market and the private sector gig economy. So if the liberal arts can't save us from ourselves, and they don't generate sustainable professions, why pursue them at all? If not for money, I guess it could only be dumb love. Or might it be nostalgia for love lost? Is it time to admit that the tweet has exhausted literature? The digital archive conquered history? Artificial intelligence transcended philosophy? Wherefore Shakespeare when the podcast? Is it a painting when it's on your phone? Why the diplomat, the economist, the academic in the age of Trump? Maybe the once proud project of the liberal arts has simply lost a war in the marketplace of ideas and should be mercifully euthanized. Perhaps critical thinking, rigorous research, innovative experimentation, and expert analysis aren't as valuable as we thought. Maybe our labor could be more profitably exploited elsewhere. Or so we're reminded as conservative legislators, trustees, and institutions relentlessly starve liberal arts programs nationwide. It's hard to conceive of a love letter to the liberal arts, then, that isn't also an impassioned defense against this ugly trend, a desperate appeal to the executioner's mercy. But when we must constantly beg for the recognition of the basic value of the liberal arts, we must also assume that our pleas will fall on deaf ears and that inevitably the axe will swing. But I hold hope that we can still find ways to speak out, to fight against these intellectually dishonest and socially destructive attacks, not only on behalf of the value of academic programs and disciplines within the liberal arts, but also for the broader projects of critical thinking, informed citizenship, and healthy community that the liberal arts promote. And I hope that we can still remember that opportunists, con artists, and tyrants fear and despise critical thinkers, and that the suppression of the liberal arts is among the first steps to authoritarianism. Though it might be tempting to resign ourselves to a shameless logic of easy money that rejects history, art, economics, political science, literature, language, and philosophy, it's clear our world needs the liberal arts now more than ever. A degree in liberal arts provides a grounding in critical and collaborative thinking while also providing sensitivity to cultural, demographic, economic, and societal differences and political perspectives. Being a liberal arts major, you become adaptable to new circumstances and learn to thrive in challenges. This degree allows me to encounter a variety of interesting people that come from various backgrounds and lifestyles. Being a non-traditional college student myself, I take comfort in this, in knowing my classrooms are not cookie cutter environments, but are ones that provide enrichment and diversity. Experiences and education in multiple disciplines create a certain depth and versatility for success in what can be a highly competitive and changing job market. The liberal arts also provide a focus on the essence of the human experience, relationships. Through my liberal arts education, I have developed multiple lenses for looking at the human experience. 
though through this type of education and degree plan, you may not get a certain precise job like a doctor or a lawyer, but instead you are given the strength to interact with anyone and the world you're in by continually learning. My professors in liberal arts have exposed me to a multitude of personalities that I enjoy and learn from immensely. Through them, I have learned things I never thought possible. For example, the most important thing I've taken from them is how language is important. The power of language gives you a voice when you thought you did not have one. It can help build connections, help you translate your experiences, communicate with others that share commonalities to give you a sense of belonging, and overall, you get a sense of knowledge that no one can take from you. I think the liberal arts offer a reprieve from this culture where we restrict value to that which is economically profitable and useful, whatever that means. Personally, I chose to study the liberal arts because I was incredibly fortunate. I received a full ride scholarship to attend Wright State so I didn't have to bear the weight of student loan debt when I decided what to study. I felt free to choose English literature and French because all that I was sacrificing was my time, and I was so happy to exchange my time for conversations about literature and language, but most of my peers don't get this chance. I feel really privileged to have had this opportunity to study without debt and choose what I loved and what mattered to me instead of job training for a career in business or something practical. More students should have this freedom. When college becomes a job training facility, only the most privileged get to take risks and pursue the subjects we study in the liberal arts. That's not egalitarian, and that's not meritocratic, a word that neoliberals love. That's elitist and classist to the core. When my friends and I talk about the liberal arts, we talk about the books we love, but we also talk about social, political, and economic problems. I believe that our training in the liberal arts has led us not just to describe how to survive in the world the way that it is, but how to imagine and build a world that's better. Some people might say that's naive, but I think that's practical. I think the most practical thing we can do is imagine how to make our little spheres of the world more equitable and humane. My voice teacher once asked me a question that could seem quite simple. Why art? It made me pause though. There are so many things I could say about art and unoriginal things at that. What I know immediately, however, is that I would be lost without words, without music, without narrative, without theater, without my books, without my flute. Art is certainly valued widely, but there is a devaluation of art around the world as well. Something I, we, hold so, so dearly is not appreciated, and at first I couldn't fathom how or why, but I think it has to do with its arguable lack of substance in the physical world, its lack of tangible, logical value, its subjectivity. Perhaps there's a fear of the freedom that is inherent to art. People don't like what they cannot understand. I am oftentimes in that same boat. I have a comfort zone that I am quite comfortable in. I like knowing the answer. At the same time, I think I've always known that there isn't really an answer. There is no one truth that dictates the world, and art is a champion of that reality. Perspectives, no matter how different, are all valid. A perspective is truth, the truth of each person who holds it, and art is, in my opinion, an exploration of those perspectives and truths. As such, art is a way to connect to the world through different lenses. To see what lenses you may share with someone you'll never get a chance to interact with otherwise. Art connects our humanity. It's a chance to experience never-ending connections from one soul to another. I was 16 and my mother was about to throw me out of the house forever for breaking a very big rule, even bigger than the forbidden books. The rule was not just no sex, 
but definitely no sex with your own sex. I was scared and unhappy. I remember going down to the library to collect the murder mysteries. One of the books my mother had ordered was called Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. She assumed it was a gory story about nasty monks, and she liked anything that was bad for the Pope. The book looked a bit short to me. Mysteries are usually quite long, so I had a look and saw that it was written in verse. Definitely not right. I had never heard of T.S. Eliot. I thought he might be related to George Eliot. The librarian told me he was an American poet who had lived in England for most of his life. He had died in 1964 and he had won the Nobel Prize. I wasn't reading poetry because my aim was to work my way through English literature in prose A to Z. But this was different. I read, this is one moment but know that another shall pierce you with a sudden painful joy. I started to cry. Readers looked up reproachfully and the librarian reprimanded me because in those days you weren't even allowed to sneeze in a library, let alone weep. So I took the book outside and read it all the way through sitting on the steps in the usual Northern gale the unfamiliar and beautiful play made things bearable that day. And the things it made bearable were another failed family. The first one was not my fault, but all adopted children blamed themselves. The second failure was definitely my fault. I was confused about sex and sexuality and upset about the straightforward practical problems of where to live what to eat and how to do my A-levels. I had no one to help me, but the T.S. Eliot helped me. So when people say that poetry is a luxury or an option or for the educated middle class or that it shouldn't be read at school because it is irrelevant or any of the strange and stupid things that are said about poetry and its place in our lives, I suspect that the people doing the saying have had things pretty easy. A tough life needs a tough language. And that is what poetry is. That is what literature offers, a language powerful enough to say how it is. It isn't a hiding place. It is a finding place. The other day, my six-year-old daughter asked me, Mom, why do you read so many books? It's so boring. My answer was simple. I love to read. I love to learn. She rolled her eyes and walked away. My daughter can't see the rewards yet. She can't appreciate the investment. She's only six. Every day, well, almost every day, my daughter reads to me for 20 minutes. It is a challenge for her. Sometimes she grunts in frustration. Most days she can't sit still. While I wish my daughter opened books with as much zeal as I do, I recognize how difficult it must be for her. And so I lead by example. After staying home for almost six years, I decided to go back to school. It hasn't been an easy transition, but what I do at school is important. Liberal arts tracks the growth and evolution of ideas over time and allows us to engage with these ideas in new and interesting ways. History, classics, art, dance, theater, English, communications, French, all of these have value. All of these studies are intrinsic to our understanding of the world. Leonardo da Vinci, after all, was both an artist and an inventor. If we lose sight of the value of liberal arts, my daughter loses, my son loses, I lose, we all lose. Perhaps my daughter will be the next epic painter and inventor. If I divest one from the other, we may never see her full potential. The world has an interesting way of changing people. Five years ago, I accepted a mission to Ohio State University to pursue an agri-science degree so that I could educate those in non-rural communities about agriculture and the opportunities it provides. 
However, as my first semester progressed, my dad became sick, and with that came a hard realization. I was stuck. Growing up, my dad would walk me to the local library each Saturday. It was on these weekly trips that I would burrow deep in a Nancy Drew novel, or waddle my way between the aisles with a stack of books taller than me. Dad would chat to the librarian about the latest book release while I carefully assessed the stacks. It was in this library that I felt the safest, because there was always some book that had the potential to explain how I was feeling. It was my dad who taught me to find myself in books because of their inclusive abilities. He encouraged me to write and tell stories like he had done my entire life. He would take me on adventures through fictional realities where one day I was a princess and the next a pirate. It was within these alternate spaces where I finally began to know myself. My dad made me come to the hard realization that maybe STEM wasn't for me, and that was okay. He was adamant that I pursue a program that not only brought out the best of me, but allowed me to share my passion with others through my teaching. The liberal arts is inclusive not because they accept everyone, but because they have something to offer everyone. As a teacher, I've encountered STEM majors who believe English isn't pertinent to their chosen path, but more often than not, it is. Courses in the liberal arts help instill a large assortment of skills needed to be successful in other majors or careers. Not everyone starts out in the library reading the Hardy Boys, but it doesn't mean you can't end up there. The liberal arts department is critical for any university or school to have. What people typically don't realize, even myself for a long time, is that liberal arts pertains to so many different disciplines. You've got art, music, theater, history, philosophy, religion, English writing, language and literature, sociology, public and international affairs, communication, dance, and motion pictures. These are just some, and liberal arts even crosses paths with other disciplines across campus, which means a major within the department allows job possibilities in so many other areas. I've got friends in law enforcement who told me their employers would absolutely hire an English major. Now, I can only go into detail about the major of English, really, because that's the major I've been working on. But what about social justice activists concerned with women, gender, and sexuality studies, African and African-American studies, or international studies? These serve as interdisciplinary programs that the liberal arts department works with and for. See, I became an English major with a passion for writing, and I'm not quite sure how I did it, but somehow I graduated high school without knowing the impact that reading has on my writing. The program takes you in, even from scratch, and works with you teaching you things in a way that makes your job capabilities broad. I'm confident right now that I could become an English teacher, police officer, or begin to dabble into motion pictures with the critical and creative thinking skills that I've learned. With the various readings and diverse courses I've taken, I would always find moments where I was like, hey, I would have written, said, or done this differently, or hey, I would have written, said, or done that differently to pertain to this particular audience or expand to a more inclusive audience. The practices in this department allow you to think critically and creatively about yourself and others. It gets you thinking about your motives, perspectives, and experiences, as well as those of others, and how you fit within those of others. It's imperative in today's age and any day's age to critically analyze the information you're taking in, even so much to the point that you can see the whys and hows of that information being created and distributed, even to the point that you can recreate and tweak that information and its distribution in a way that you're using your perspective and applying it to the bigger picture of all of us. Because everybody has different dreams, and we're not here to serve everybody and all their dreams. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the arts, 
as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. When I was 10, my dad had a heart attack. In the months that followed, he underwent quadruple bypass surgery and studied to get his GED. I asked why he'd do it, and he told me that it was because he wanted to show me that it was possible and that learning was about more than a piece of paper you earned. A few years later, the summer before I started my freshman year of high school, my mom gave me a summer reading list filled with Howard Zen, Richard Wright, Karl Marx, Gloria Steinem, Angela Davis, and James Baldwin. It's the authors they won't teach you in school that you'll learn the most from, she told me. I struggled to find a place in higher education. I didn't think there was somewhere for a poor girl born to a working class parents who didn't get to finish college. College was a privilege, knowledge was a privilege, and I didn't come from the right social class to deserve such a privilege. The faculty at Wright State changed that for me. Suddenly, I was given not just permission, but support and tools with which to dream outside of my material conditions. What Wright State is doing is class warfare. When a board member is quoted as saying that Wright State is not here to make students' dreams come true, the administration lets us know that their priority is student success only as far as student success is part of becoming an exploited workforce. When I've expressed concern over the future of liberal arts to chairs, deans, and the board of the university, I was asked why I would be concerned since I was graduating. I was shocked and saddened by the lack of understanding. My parents may not have finished college, but they know more about the true value and purpose of education than those tasked with advocating for student success in academia. I love studying in the liberal arts because it helped me understand the struggles and joys of those around me while also teaching me to dream outside of what I knew. Dear liberal arts, I love you because you helped me unbury myself, find my body, understand what it is to be a body in this institution, in this country, in this world, my woman's body, my queer body, my veteran body, my resisting body. There are nightmares embedded in the invisibility of bodies, the gravest of which lies in our disconnection from ourselves, our histories, and our languages. We are largely taught from childhood onward a language that propels the commodification of our bodies in the interests of somebody else. Liberal arts taught me another language, one that accounts for all the ways I am a body in this life, all the ways I might build a future that includes multitudes of stories like my own. We talk about dreams, dreams coming true, dreams fulfilled in the spaces of learning. We've been told that this institution isn't here to serve everybody and make everybody's dreams come true. And dreams are important, but I'd like to focus on another word in that statement. Everybody. If academia isn't here to serve everybody, let us ask, which bodies does it exist to serve? Which bodies do we strategize for when there is no mention of liberal arts and planning documentation? Liberal arts gave me the tools to exist in this body, and I will use all I've gathered here to work toward a continuing path for everybody in higher education. One of the reasons that people create art is to make sense of the issues we face. This semester, our faculty at Wright State University went on strike in order to maintain their bargaining rights. The administration's reaction to the strike was gross. The administration issued threatening claims to students and made statements that devalued the professors who are the lifeblood of Wright State. Students reacted to these threatening false claims in many ways, one being a silent sit-in. On February 6, 2019, students lined up outside of the president's office to support striking faculty and to push for a resolution to the strike. Many of those students were from the College of Liberal Arts. 
That first day of the sit-in, the administration used intimidation by campus and local police to try and end our protest. But despite the fear we faced, we held our ground to stand or sit for what we believe in. I created this painting to help make sense of what we went through during the sit-in and the strike as a whole. Students represented by red bodies became a spectacle for the administration and the press. This painting is from my memory of where I sat during the sit-in, during a very tense moment when the police walked past us and out of the building without arresting us. Wright State students are still feeling the effects and trauma of the strike. This painting is one way for me to make sense of the trauma we faced. As someone studying acting, it's hard for me to see a lack of respect and understanding from those that I want to entertain and bring joy to. That's what the arts have always been for me, bringing joy to people through my passions. But the arts are also more than that. When people are involved with the arts, it acts as an opening in their minds and their hearts to see the world and themselves differently. It gives us strength and empathy. I'm surrounded every day by the most hardworking, passionate artists who have followed their goals through and created beautiful works of art, even if it seemed mundane to the outside eye. Art is not just a hobby. It's a job, and it's a hard one but it brings us joy. The arts provide a place of safety for all people to share their passions, their fears, their joys, and everything in between. The arts give people a home. What I value most about the liberal arts is that we are encouraged to study a diversity of subjects which allows us to gain an understanding on a wide variety of topics, ranging from literature and composition to the sciences. I chose to study a field within the liberal arts because the ones within this college, such as modern languages and social work, were the ones with which I connected the most. While I loved STEM classes in elementary and high school, I never really saw myself entering into a STEM field in my professional career. Furthermore, a liberal arts major allowed me to gain the most from my time at Wright State. When my friends and I discuss the liberal arts, the conversation tends to involve discussions on innovation and a chance to play. By this, I mean our majors allow us a chance to learn the basics of our professions theories, methods of practice, etc., while also creating new ways to explore and interact with said basics. We constantly challenge each other to go beyond the boundaries and safe space of sticking with the status quo of our majors, which betters us as students and future social workers, therapists, performers, and so on. I remember the professor for my intro to social work class telling us that social work was in the College of Liberal Arts because the core classes we needed to take allowed us to gain a wider worldview that we could then incorporate into our future practice, an opportunity that may not have otherwise been presented to us. It's difficult to quantify what we cannot see. It's difficult to understand things that do not offer quick solutions. And it's hard to make connections between ideas that do not seem to have anything in common. That's what English majors do all the time. Making connections between disparate ideas is a valuable skill as much now as it ever has been. To the outside world, it might seem like we're just writing poems and hugging trees, but that's not accurate at all. Learning how to closely read and respond to texts enables students to think critically about what they're seeing and hearing. Bringing different ideas together helps us to appreciate other points of view. We're better informed voters and more compassionate global citizens. A society can be judged by the quality of its culture, and the liberal arts teach us to create that culture. It's tough, and there isn't a simple answer at the end of the equation. I read recently that English classes cause more stress than any other on a college campus, and I believe that. There's no easy answer to any writing assignment. You, can, you have to think for yourself and develop your own argument in the essay. You have to learn to be comfortable with, I don't know. You have to accept what may make you uncomfortable 
with uh, as your research leads you in a way that you didn't know that it was going to. You have to accept that there may never be an answer. It's not for everyone, but it is for some. The ones who navigate that rough and rugged road become valuable employees after graduation, since their major has helped them to develop vital communication and analysis skills. No light bulb turns on until it's connected. The liberal arts help to deepen the sources of wisdom by learning how others dealt with failures, successes, difficulties, and victories. Also, it is to have the ability to distinguish the differences between meaningful and meaningless aspects of our civilization. Liberal arts studying help to practice analytical and thinking skills that are required to be a successful student, a person, or a successful employee. Liberal arts help to support and strengthen the local art community by learning how to appreciate and value the creativity. Liberal arts help to develop a global perspective by studying cultures from all over the world. Liberal arts help deepening the understanding and the appreciation of other cultures and other people's experiences. Liberal arts help to identify links between all areas of knowledge and how they fit together. Liberal arts help identify the personal values by comparing them with what others what others think. Finally, liberal arts help to improve oral and written communication skills. I have chosen to study the liberal arts because I believe that the progress and prosperity of nations comes from the great minds that think, analyze, and plan to push their societies and civilization forward to be a better version of themselves. In addition to that, I highly value the importance of critical thinking when my friends and I talk about the liberal arts, especially literature, we talk about how the liberal arts help to record the political, social, economic, and even the military events of the past, and how it is important to learn from these events. Another thing we talk about is that is the transfer and preservation of the human experiences across generations that benefited humanity. In my senior year of high school, my English teacher asked me if I had any interest in continuing English in college. I told her I didn't have any plans for it. I had grown up wanting to be a veterinarian, and I actually didn't like high school English. It seemed like it wasn't important to me. And I even remember one of my math teachers telling us, none of your classes are as important as what you're going to learn in here. I think that stuck with me for a while, and when I went to college, I took classes for a pre-vet program, a bunch of chemistry and biology. I wasn't very good at it. It didn't stick no matter how long I stayed up studying, how many labs I went to, or how many chemical formulas I balanced. I didn't like it, but I forced myself to stick with it. At the same time, I learned that I could major in an unrelated field and heard that schools looked at that as being well-rounded. I liked writing. I liked the single English class I had taken in my second semester, so I decided to major in English. I loved it. Yet I forced myself to take chemistry classes that I hated to justify my major in English. My friends would ask what I planned on doing with an English degree with such smug looks on their faces that I felt the need to pretend I wasn't doing anything. After graduation, I stagnated. I had told myself I couldn't do anything with my degree because so many people had told me I couldn't. That was wrong, though. It wasn't just about getting a job out of college. It was genuine enjoyment. I decided I wanted to go back to school. And when people asked me what I thought about grad school, I said, It's great to be back. I really miss this. Today, I was walking through the student union while trying to figure out how I was going to come up with the words to express my appreciation for my liberal arts degree when I came across a banner near the conference wing that said, we cater to your every whim. I don't know about everyone else, but I did not choose to go to college on a whim and I definitely did not 
choose to pursue a career in the very unstable field of academia on a whim. I also noticed there wasn't an asterisk beside whim. It didn't say, unless you want to be an artist or a performer on Broadway. It didn't read, we cater to your every whim, unless you want to be a poet or professional tap dancer. My choice to go into academia was not a choice I made for financial stability. It was a choice I made because I believe the world can become a better place only when we have people who can think for themselves and think critically. This is a skill we can refine through courses in literature, creative writing, theater, art, and the like. Critical thinking is a skill required by most professions, and there are aspects of this reflected in every standardized test that will get someone into their dream job. For me, choosing to pursue a Master of Arts in Literature was the hardest decision I have ever made. In the end, I chose it because I want to teach future undergraduates how to write more eloquently, speak with purpose, and think in a way that is their own. As a student who was finishing the last of her medical school prerequisites just under a year ago, I know firsthand this is not something students get when they pursue degrees in the hard sciences. Degrees in the liberal arts are degrees in favor of a better future, and diminishing or discontinuing them would be a true tragedy. As a doctor, I had some sense of what patients with life-changing illnesses faced, and it was exactly these moments I had wanted to explore with them. Shouldn't terminal illness then be the perfect gift to a young man who had wanted to understand death? What better way to understand it than to live it? But I'd had no idea how hard it would be, how much terrain I would have to explore, map, settle, I'd always imagined the doctor's work as something like connecting two pieces of railroad track, allowing a smooth journey for the patient. I hadn't expected the prospect of facing my own mortality to be so disorienting, so dislocating. Lost in a featureless wasteland of my own mortality and finding no traction in the realms of scientific studies, intracellular molecular pathways, and endless curves of survival statistics, I began reading literature again. I was searching for a vocabulary with which to make sense of death, to find a way to begin defining myself and inching forward again. The privilege of direct experience had led me away from literary and academic work, yet now I felt that to understand my own direct experiences I would have to translate them back into language. And so it was literature that brought me back to life during this time. The monolithic uncertainty of my future was deadening. Everywhere I turned, the shadow of death obscured the meaning of any action. I remember the moment when my overwhelming unease yielded, when that seemingly impassable sea of uncertainty parted. I woke up in pain, facing another day no project beyond breakfast seemed tenable. I can't go on, I thought. And immediately, its antiphon responded, completing Samuel Beckett's seven words, words I had learned long ago as an undergraduate. I'll go on. I got out of bed and took a step forward, repeating the phrase over and over, I can't go on, I'll go on. Because I could, because that's who I was because I would have to learn to live in a different way, seeing death as an imposing itinerant visitor, but knowing that even if I'm dying, until I actually die, I am still living. I am passionate about the power of new ways of thinking, and I believe that a liberal arts education provides ways of understanding the world that isn't rooted in a single discipline. That is because the liberal arts is a field full of diverse subjects and diverse students. The College of Liberal Arts pulls from many different disciplines so students can understand the world through different lenses. This diversity in education doesn't just shape a mind, it opens it to new possibilities and new ways of thinking. A liberal arts education equips people with the ability to question assumptions, 
their own and others, which allow them to approach issues from multiple angles and to discover the best solutions for those issues. And today, more than ever, we need critical thinkers to help solve the social, political, and economic issues facing our world. Critical thinking is not an easy thing to do. I think there is a misconception that the liberal arts is an easy field, that liberal art majors do not need to put forward the same amount of effort that other fields need to. The truth is that English studies or history studies, performance arts, acting, dancing, singing, all require an ability to take abstract ideas and make them solid, make them material. The College of Liberal Arts provides the tools to reify those abstract ideas. So that's why I value the liberal arts. As for the question of why should someone choose to study liberal arts, other than the reasons I already gave, why can't the answer simply be that that person may want to? Allow people to study what they are passionate about, because the arts make life worth living. Science, mathematics, and physics allows us to understand the world as it is, and can provide new advances that can provide longer, healthier lives. But the arts is the reason that we live. Both are important for sure, science and technology provide the answer to how we live, but art provides the answer to why we live. Oh